Yeah, and thank you so much for the invitation. I didn't know that Nashville had a Tableau group. This is wonderful. So well, there you go. Hey, to advertise, right? Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy the newbies group this morning? Oh, it was great. This actually, I was, um, I was really hoping that we would have a session on calculations, and sure enough, there it was. That was perfect timing. Everybody loves Sarah. We had Sarah Banner when we talked about mapping. Everybody loves Sarah. Okay, she's fabulous. Unfortunately, I think for her, uh, Klaus. Klaus Schulte and Jeremy and I co lead that group. And uh, we might have taken up a little bit of her time, but I think it all worked out in the end. I'm, I'm glad you were able to attend and I'm glad you're here tonight. Yeah, so, sorry, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Um, unfortunately, I, I do. Uh, I, I was um, tested positive for COVID and I'm quarantining, but but um, ah. happy to be able to attend virtually. So thank you. Okay, and you and Eden. Eden is one of our uh, co-leaders of that uh, of that group, and and Eden is one of the co-leaders of that uh, group. And she's in Indianapolis. She tested positive, and she was uh, out on the call this morning. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Lindsay, if uh, if you're set to go, you can come right up here and I'll get out of the way and you can do your thing. Okay. Oh, can you <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Uh, I've invited Lisa um, Preston here today, and uh, just so we can learn a little bit more about how she got here, how she joined the Tableau group, and what she does with her job. So thanks for coming today. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, so what brought you to Nashville? How long have you been here? And um, tell us how you, how you found us. Um, I moved to Nashville 18 years ago. Uh, I used to work for Sirius Satellite Radio and was part of the programming and administration team. And they sent me down here to open their very first programming office. So that's how I ended up here. Um, spent 15 years in the music business, uh, became redundant, and then spent 10 years as a STEM and robotics teacher. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, discovered data and um, have a turn back. <laughs> so when you say discovered data, like what, is, what turned you on and like what, was the, what were the first things you started clinging to when you were well, like, training? Or... Yeah, so as a robotics teacher, I was starting to get into some basic coding, which was really exciting. And then in my personal time, I am an augmented reality and virtual reality artist. And so um, trying to figure out what I was gonna do after teaching, I was trying to figure out how to marry the visual aspects and the coding aspects and um, data analytics just seemed like a really natural progression for me. Um, and so I played with a lot of the tools and Tableau just has a really special place in my heart because of its um, beautiful visualizations. And when you do this augmented reality art, like what 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 software do you use to do that? Or do you use software? And not <clears throat> so uh, both. Um, I do fine art paintings, and then uh, I add augmentations to it using digital platforms uh, like Artivide, where I can upload video files and things that I create that will basically supplement the art. Well, yeah. I did learn about everyone's hobby. You know? <laughs> There's a lot of things that keep us motivated and excited yeah. besides our own professional work. So. For sure. And what kind of things do you do in your professional world today? So I work at Louisiana Pacific here in Nashville. Um, it was my very first job out of data camp and where I have learned everything that I know about data analytics, um, essentially. I uh, started as a level one analyst, uh, went to a level two analyst, and now I am a scrum master and data literacy. Okay. Yeah. And good. what? Where, where did you take the data, the data camp? Where, what, what resources do you use? I um, did the trilogy program through Vanderbilt University. It was a really great six month data analytics. Um, in and out. It was a part time boot camp, but it was one of the most intense experiences. Do you have a full time job in addition to that? Or is it one of those things that you recommend? 
to others. You know, um, I did have a full-time job and it was not unmanageable. Um, it's a lot, it's commitment. Yeah, it's commitment. Yeah. And what kind of business questions do you use at um, your job at LP? So um, when I was doing primarily reporting, I focused a lot on uh, human resources, uh, reporting, headcount, uh, let's see, retention, um, turnover, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Got to know you a little bit better, Lisa. We really Thank appreciate you. it. So. I appreciate it. Um, we're hungry. So check it. She's hiring. <laughs> we're going to give you the opportunity to bring that up again later. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll share a little bit more at the end if we can. I'll contact details. So awesome. Thanks, y'all. Excellent. We go great. Now, are you ready to listen? Oh, my turn. Okay. It's just your turn. And uh, I just want to introduce you a little bit. So let's, hey, for, for those of you who have been with the uh, Nashville Tug Group, in the days before the uh, two and a half year uh, hiatus, um, you probably remember uh, Alyssa. Alyssa, she's no, she's no longer with the A.L. Smith, but she used to be with A.L. Smith. And uh, the last, I think it was the last live meeting we had, Alyssa presented at the meeting. And then we stopped going live. <laughs> so Alyssa, we got a lot of faith in you. We got a lot of trust in you. Don't bury us for two and a half more years. Hey, Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you. And if you're ready, you can share your screen and take over the show. All right. I think everybody should see my screen now. Um, our session today is going to be on making your maps go further. We're going to do some demos of the spatial functions that are available within Tableau. Uh, for those of you who are curious and would like to follow along or would like to have the data and the workbooks available for future reference, uh, I shared in the chat the link to that content, which I've uploaded to data.world. Uh, if you don't have a data.world account, sign up for one. It's totally worth it and totally free. Um, a little bit about me. I'm currently a senior consultant with Lovelytics. They're a consulting firm based out of Arlington, Virginia. Uh, but I have seven years of previous experience uh, as an analyst and a manager of analytics, as Jim mentioned, at A.O. Smith, a manufacturing company here in Nashville. Um, I've also previously worked as a data consultant for a global accounting firm, BDO. Um, fun fact, that is my dog, Oliver. He makes it into all of my presentations, uh, and we enjoy doing anything outside. So let's go ahead and jump into what are spatial functions and how do they work? So spatial functions are available in Tableau and they essentially allow you to perform advanced spatial analytics on your data. So using these spatial files or joining these spatial files with other data sources to enhance your understanding of geographic data. There are kind of five primary spatial functions available within Tableau. Um, you can see them listed out here on the right. We're pretty much going to cover all of them except for the very last one. And depending on time, we may or may not make it to the, the main line uh, graph, but it's included in the workbook as a bonus if you're curious. So without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and jump into our first example. Um, the first view that we want to build is a map of the different zip code boundaries that exist within Nashville. And we want to color that map by square miles. So if we look at our data source here, our very first 01 Nashville zip code boundaries data source, you'll see that this data source type is a spatial file. You connect to spatial files like shapefiles um, as you would any other data source in Tableau. You'll see that this data source has a field that is identified as a geographic field in Tableau. And you'll see that it just consists of this text called a polygon. And I'll show you what that looks like once you pull this into the map view. If we double click on that polygon geometry field, you'll see that it creates a map of our Nash Nashville zip code boundaries. But you'll see that it creates it as a single mark. And we can tell that when you click on it, it's all just one big shape. And if we look at our mark count here, we've just got one. If we want to identify the distinct zip codes, we can add the zip code field to the detail of our view. 
And now we have 39 marks, which are the 39 unique zip code boundaries that exist within the Nashville metro area. To calculate that square miles that we want to color this geography by, we're going to create a calculated field and utilize one of those spatial functions. So we're going to call this zip area. And we're going to utilize that area function, which consists of the polygon field that we referenced earlier, that geometry field. And then we're going to specify the units that we want to apply to that field. So in this case, miles. Once that field is created, we can add it to the view on the color mark to identify the area that is contained within a given zip code. So fairly simple. The great thing about some of these spatial calculations is that you can use it just as you would use any other, any other measure that you would use in Tableau. So for instance, say we wanted to identify which zip codes have the most area, we can build out a bar chart just as we would, sorry, my zoom is in the way. Sorry guys, okay. We can build out a, a bar chart now using that zip code field um, and that area field that we created, just like you would any other measure um, that you would utilize in Tableau. You have the same functionality to sort by that measure, um, to do you know, top end calculations, just as you would any other measure in Tableau. Are there any questions on the area spatial functionality? Okay. Our third example that I want to get into now is um, spatial joins. So our, our third example is we want to kind of reutilize that zip code boundary map, but now we want to join it with some of the art information that's available um, through Nashville's data website. So if we look at our second data source, you'll see that we have that spatial file that we pulled in just like we did before. And now we have this art in public places uh, CSV file. Um, it's just a standard CSV. And what we want to do is we want to join these two data sets together so that we can analyze them um, as kind of a, a singular data set. For those of you who are more familiar with some of the recent updates that Tableau has made to relationships, if you drag this in, it's going to initially try to create a relationship between these two data sources. Um, as a word of warning, you can't actually use the spatial joint functions in relationships. So you have to convert this back to a standard join by double clicking on your source. And you'll see once we drag this in, you get the whole join style um, kind of stinks, but that's where we are. <laughs> um, to do a join on our spatial fields, we're going to select the spatial field from our spatial file, geometry. And you'll see that you have a couple of different join options here, but we actually want to join this to another spatial field in our arts and public places file. And you'll see that while we have latitude and longitude, we don't actually have a spatial field. So we can create one using a join calculation. And the function we want to use here is make point, where essentially what we're going to do is create a single uh, geographic point using those latitude and longitude fields. So now when that uh, join calculate field is created, you'll actually see this new option to join based off of intersects. So anywhere where our polygon from our left data source intersects with point in our arts and public places data source, that's what we want to include. We're going to make this a full outer join because we want everything from both data sources. And now we're going to jump back to our example three. So we want to create a map by zip code boundary. Hopefully this sounds familiar. We just did it. So we're going to add that geometry field with our national zip codes. We're going to add the distinct zip codes for each of those areas. And now what I want to do is I want to look at my art and public places data source. And I want to count how many public art pieces there are in each zip code. 
So that allows me to count. Uh, I'm actually just going to color by this. So I'm going to drag it to color. And now I can see that I have anywhere from zero to 33 um, public art pieces in our Nashville zip code areas. Let's say we wanted to take this a step further and we wanted to utilize the map layer function functionality that exists in Tableau. We can do that um, and say we wanted to kind of overlay where the actual art pieces are within these zip codes. To do that, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new um, spatial function. So we're going to create a calculated field. And I'm going to call this my art geography. So this is that similar geometry field from our national zip codes. Now we're going to make a point with that latitude. Whoops. Latitude and longitude from our art and public places data. And we're going to add it using the map layers functionality available in Tableau to identify where those different public art places are. Similar to the zip code, you'll see that it's added as one single mark. If we add some details to this, it will start to differentiate those as individual marks. So I'm going to add title. Uh, I'm going to add description and location. And I want to go ahead and color those marks by the type of artwork that's being displayed. I'm going to convert my um, geometry field from a, a map kind of layout to actual circles, mainly because I think they're really small and I'm blind. So I'm going to make them a little bit bigger. And again, you can clean up your tooltip. So we have the title of the artwork, the location of the artwork. What else did I include in here? The type of the artwork and the description. And now what I have is my zip code boundaries. So within a given zip code, how many um, unique art pieces are there? And if I hover over one of these art pieces, let's find one with a description. Here we go. Um, a splash of color is a mural that's available at 616 17th Avenue. And it's a wood, wooden figure with streamers along the south wall of the building. So now I've got some additional detail and some additional layers to my map that really makes this data pop and come alive. Similar to the area calculation that we performed before, you can utilize this spatially joined data just as you would any other types of data that you're used to working with in Tableau where you can use dimensions and measures across data sources. So for instance, let's say we wanted to create that bar chart of the number of art pieces by zip code. We're going to do a count of our titles. And then we want to sort that bar chart oops, by the field. So there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to uh, geographic data that's available in Tableau. You've got a lot of spatial functions you can work with to learn different things about that geographic data. Um, make point, uh, the, the spatial joins are really powerful. Any questions on spatial joins or the make point function? Okay. I think I have time for one more. Do I have time for one more? Okay. All right. We will go ahead and get to our bonus. Um, this one is probably one of my favorites. So this bonus is going to be a make line chart where essentially what we want to do is we've joined our Nashville traffic incident data with our uh, Nashville precinct locations. And I want to know based off the Nashville precinct assigned to the traffic accident, where did these precincts actually answer calls about these traffic accidents? Are they staying within their precinct? Are they going out of their precinct, et cetera, et cetera. So the way we wanna do this is we want to have our different geographies here. Um, so for instance, I have a police geo field, which is the make point location of my police latitude and police longitude data. If I add this um, to my map, you can kind of see what that looks like. So these are the different Nashville precincts. But first,
first, what I really want to do is I want to make a line between my Nashville police precinct location and my accident location. So did I already create an accident? Yep. So I have a similar geographic field here of accident geo, which is the main point of my accident location. And now what I want to do is I want to use those two points to make a line. So I'm going to call this make line because I'm very original. Um, and I very happy to make line. So let's call this make line two. So we want to use the make line function where essentially we want to reference the police geography and our accident geography. And this is going to create a line between those two destinations. What I can do now is I can add that make line field to my data source. And you will see that I have a ton of lines that have been created. For the sake of visibility, I'm going to limit this to just the accidents that have occurred so far in June. So I'm going to say month and year of June 2022. So now I have kind of these lines. Again, you'll see that they've been created as just one single mark. If we want to differentiate those lines, what we're going to do is we're going to pull in the unique accident number so that we go from one mark to 314 unique marks. If I wanted to add some context to this information, um, I can do that by, say, coloring by precinct. So I'm going to go ahead and pull in my precinct to color. So these are our different Nashville police precincts. And I want to go ahead and use that map layers functionality to mark out the center point, which is the precinct location. So I'm going to add that uh, precinct uh, make point calculated field to my map layers. And then I need to add in the precinct name to detail to give it a unique mark. And I'm going to go ahead and make them black so they're really easy to see. And I'm going to change them to circles and make them a little bit larger again because I'm kind of blind. So now you can kind of see where these items overlap. So for instance, we have a, a Midtown Hills police precinct, but it looks like they responded to an accident that was kind of in the Madison precinct. So again, I can add some additional details um, to these accidents based off the data that's available. So the harmful description number one um, here, I could add that into detail as part of my tooltip. So I could learn a little bit more, well, this was a motor vehicle in transit. Um, so you just have all these different types of details that you can add in to learn more about your data. Um, and where, where your data is going geographically based off of those geographic fields and using the tableau spatial functions. So that's my demo. Um, again, for those of you just. Well, I, got a, I got a couple, oh, couple okay. of questions for you. Go for it. Now, first of all, down in the corner there, you got something that says you got two notes. You want to you explain those? Oh, yep. What that little box is all about? <laughs> So your nulls are going to be values that don't have a latitude or longitude assigned to them in the data, or they're going to be latitudes and longitudes that are not legitimate latitudes and longitudes. Um, a quick way to see what those nulls are, if you're curious, um, you can filter your data. And then I always like to swap this from, yeah, so we've got a bunch of null values. So those are null values that we're looking at. Uh, and we can look at them as a cross tab. So you can kind of see the different nulls. I happen to know there were quite a few traffic accidents that were, uh, they didn't have a geography recorded. So they happened somewhere that we don't know. <laughs> see, everybody, I, I, everybody loves maps. You know, I love maps and <laughs> making maps. Everybody loves maps. But it's, it's really important to understand nuances like that because there's something wrong with the data yeah okay and sometimes what's wrong with the data is correctable and in this case it's not correctable they, they didn't record the data you know you know they didn't record the data and then you can move on the other the other point to be made here is, is what you're seeing and what uh Alyssa has shown is really relatively new functionality it is 
if you go back uh, pre COVID, 2019.3, I think, was where they first released some of the spatial functions, right. make point and area. And buffer. And oh, buffer. No, buffer followed later. I think buffer was later. Yeah, bu bu buffer followed later. And it's only recently that layers were available. I love map layers. Map layers. Before, if you've ever used any sort of any sort of mapping software, you usually plot on layers. There were two layers available prior to layers being introduced, and now there's essentially as many layers as you want. Yep. And then just recently, with the latest release, we're now able to layer data from different data sources, yep. and that was a big, big deal. Layers came out and all the, all the spatial information had to be in the same data source. Now you can bring it in different data sources and you can find different data sources on the same map. And that's a big deal. Everybody loves map. You use them in your presentation because it really makes a big, big difference. As usual, you were fantastic. Let's hope I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, but it's way good. We know you, you can blame me. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Eric, are you ready with the uh, quiz? I am ready. Okay, take it away. All right, so here's our game pin number. I'll give you a second to pull it up on your uh, web browser. And for the folks in the room, let's send around the QR code so they can load the app to get that going. I can see so we're going to try something different today. <clears throat> so I've gone through Tableau Public and downloaded some visualizations. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to look at it, look for something obvious, and then we're going to go to a question about that visualization so that you can you know, do some analytics on it. Okay, so we've got seven different slides and uh, we'll work through them and see what sort of uh you get four players you can pull out the room yeah. kind of dead in this room first oh, no We good to go. One, one second. We got a couple of people hooking into the Wi Fi. Ah, okay. Okay. I think you're probably good. For those of you who aren't with us, the uh, oh. venue we're at is Baco, and it is a really nice setup here in Mellon Farms. It's on the lake. They have a bar area with couches and uh, booze, and uh, which we're going to participate in after this meeting's over. Um, we've got pizza. So, in I think it's October, we're going to have another hybrid meeting. So, join us then, and uh, we may be back here, we may be someplace else. We're also going to have a, another day to night out in August. Not sure where that's going to be yet, but uh, we're trying to pick someplace fun. All right, everybody ready to go? Here we go. This is reading a Tableau Public Biz quiz. So, first up, All right, let's see the question. How many steps were taken in Wonderland? So 125 million, 125, 125 billion, or 125K? And again, this speed is the key here if you want to win and get the most points. So 125K. All right, Alyssa. Here we go. Dungeons and Dragons. Stranger Things. Nice. Okay. Next up. 
which Dungeon and Dragon character can cast the most class of spells? The Ranger, the Sorcerer, the Wizard, or the Warlock? And correct, it is the Wizard. All right. No change in status. Next. This is a biz on depression, which is the most common symptom of depression. Sleep problems, loss of interest, low energy, or low self-esteem. All right, low energy is correct. There we go. This is hanged on. Somebody's Lisa's coming up on her. Fire. Here we go. Energy in Africa. What metric is used to calculate the 51.25 measure of cost? Average, dollar per month, median, or mean? All right. I told you they were going to be easy. <laughs> in Pride Month. Yo, what year did the U.S. start celebrating Pride Month? 1977, 1970, 1972, or 1997? Correct answer is 1970. That would be great. This uh, holds on to her lead. <laughs> All right. Awkward person. <laughs> <laughs> Tableau Chart Builder. This is a really cool biz on Tableau Public. You haven't seen it. Right. Question is Tableau Chart Builder is what? A collection of Tableau chart templates, a big book of dashboards, a Tableau biz cookbook, or a step by step guide? And it is a step by step guide. Do blue. No, we've got one more. This is from uh, the Iron Biz. Ready? What is the literacy rate in Cambodia? 85.4, 73.9, 79.3, 79 or 99.0? Man, you don't cruise through that. It does help have the answers pop up on the screen at the end. <laughs> All right. Number three is Molly. And number two is Lisa. And at the top, and always at the top, is <laughs> A little different this time. Um, if you send us your email address in the chat to Jim Beater. Um, we will forward them to Tableau and they will contact you with a prize. We, they're not giving us gift certificates anymore, but uh, they will send you something to we'll send us your email and we will get that to you. We refer to that as progress. All right, thanks everybody. Just by the show of hands, how many, how many saw I am this issue? Yeah. Okay, everybody here in this room, and I can see on the uh, virtual screen that everybody's there saw it. That was uh, Kimberly Scott's uh, yeah. biz, and if you didn't see it, her story was fantastic. Right. Let's put it like this her story was absolutely fantastic. And uh, uh, the other two just, uh, just told me outstanding, also. Okay, now we're ready for our last presentation. All right, Ellen, can you share your screen? I sure can. We see you, Melvin. Are you ready to uh, share your screen and we'll turn it over to you? Yeah, can you hear me? You sure can. Yeah. Cool. All right.
right. Let's see. You guys can see my face, right? Correct. Cool. All right. All right. Can you guys see the screen? Yes. All right, everyone. My name is Alvin Wint, and I'm here to present to you the Consultant's Guide to Successful Data Programs. And let me move this out of the way. All right, just a little bit about myself uh, before we move on. Um, I wanted to, hold on, my thing was working. Um, so I'm Alvin, if you didn't see already. Um, right now, I work for a company called RxA, who specializes in data services for a bunch of different companies. Um, some big companies include like Ford, uh, ESPN, and a, a myriad of different ones. And I've been able and had the opportunity to work with dozens of different companies um, throughout my career. Um, I'm also a uh, assistant instructor at Nashville Software School. Uh, for their data science program. And I also consider myself a data scientist as well, um, as well as a consultant in terms of the work I do. Because I still, as much as I consult, I still get into the technical details of all of that, those items. But um, I also just wanted to give a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from Arizona and my journey uh, in data kind of started from an accounting finance standpoint. Uh, and that's when I first joined in accounting. It's kind of my first experience with becoming a Tableau user. Um, I've also had the great opportunity of working with a bunch of Fortune 500 companies, uh, which eventually led me to become a CEO of a major hospital in Arizona. Um, but from then on, um, I decided to make the transition uh, and move to Nashville and make the transition into consulting uh, and also transition full-time into working with data. Uh, uh, right now, I I can say I'm trained in Python, R, SQL, JavaScript, also familiar with a lot of other uh, cloud platforms such as AWS and Azure. But in some of my engagements that I work with, a lot of the, the clients that I work with use Tableau. So um, that's what I appear today. But also as an aside, I also love the river. I'm a water person and it's a great place to be in Tennessee. And I also have two amazing dogs. One is a winter dog named Chaco. And the other one is a pug named Pogi. And there they are right there on a pizza, which is Chaco. He always likes to eat pizza. Then Pogi's favorite food is steak. All right. I want to transition um, into talking about successful data programs. Right now I have on the screen Valdosa Wildcats. If you didn't know why, why are they popular, they're from Georgia. They're the most winningest high school football team in the United States with over 929 con like con consecutive wins. Um, and or cumulative wins rather. And, and here's some other things that, that they're known for um, in terms of that. But they've, at Valdosta, Georgia, they've created a program that has done great year over year. And I wanted to know and ask like, what are those reasons that you can create a team that is great year after year? Could you say it's because of the players? You could, but eventually the players graduate every four years you it could attract more players but essentially the players transition in and out so you could have a good season for maybe a period of time but maybe not another period but they've been able to do it year over year well how about coaches have the coaching staff been consistent well the coaching staff has transitioned over time and have had many generations of coaching staff but they've been able to turn out a great product so you can't say it's entirely up to the coaches but we can say that the real reason that they came to produce these outcomes year over year is because they've created a successful program, regardless of the players and or the coaches that are in them and, and evolve through them. And essentially, when you're creating a data program, those are the things you want to keep in mind. You want to create something that will live on past your power users and the people that are I consider the subject matter experts in the things and regardless of the board direction um, and kind of create an uh, ideal where there's no any siloed or single performer that carries all the work. Um, in, in all the successful data programs that I've seen and have seen in the past, it always has to be an organizational initiative with everybody doing their part. So that brings me to the first step in developing a data programs. And this is where you need to start is setting your goals for your program. Right now, I'm kind of talking from a top level, like, enterprise kind of like a more of a leadership standpoint, but I'll, I'll eventually dial down and how that can dial down to the people that are those subject matter experts or those people that are individual contributors um, as, as you get to know more and more what upper management is looking for. So 
in terms of setting your goals, you, there's different types of goals. You want to set your overall goals from a strategic standpoint, your outcomes that you want to base off of those goal, those um, standpoints, and then audience-based goals too, like in terms of what is our customer wanting? What, what, are, what are the goals for our customers? What are our goals for our vendors? What are our goals for our employees? So there's, those are different types. And then within the organization, you can segment that and get more granular with it. From maybe a top-level goal from a company perspective is we want to you know, have growth of five percent year over year but how do we do that you break that down to departmental goals well in order for that marketing needs to hit certain targets and operations need to hit some manufacturing needs to hit certain targets which trickles down even to more personal individual goals so from a salesperson perspective what goals does that person need to meet to either meet their bonuses but also meet again the company goals that we're trying to reach so thinking from the top down level you can kind of see where your piece of the pie kind of feeds up the chain these are some questions. I'm not going to read through all of them. I'll, I'll, I'll read to a, a few of them, but you need to ask questions constantly throughout the process. As consultants, we always ask questions just because we, we try to understand what the problem really is or what they're trying to accomplish. But as a person within a company or a person that's working for a company, it's good to ask these questions in terms of just throwing technology at a problem. You, you the technology is used to serve your purposes and not the other way around. So um, asking those questions like, what problem are we trying to serve? Are those current, the land, data landscape that we have, are we, are, is that crucial or is, is that in place so we can actually solve this problem? If we don't, what tools do we need? What training do we need for those tools? What help do we need to solve this problem? Do we have expertise in house or do we need to pull them, uh, outsource it? So these are just some of the, some of the questions that, that you can ask, but, always unpeel the onion and, and find out to the root of where you can actually find a metrics or a KPI to be able to solve these issues. Um, coming in and consulting from organizations, here are some of the common issues that we find uh, when looking at data. Like you can see that there's multiple data sources that have the same data, duplication of the data. Uh, there's not clean or validated hidden data. All of these different things add up to add a headache in terms of trying to create data that is can be brought to insights and data that can be brought to the point of being reproducible and scalable. Um, I wanted to talk briefly on like how, how do we have multiple data sources? A lot of the times, like again, it goes again to get into the problem of creating a data program with the, the Valdosta High School is sometimes somebody leadership will come in and they'll tend to take a take a certain direction. They'll buy certain tool sets or systems and put them in place. And then they'll eventually maybe leave the company. And then the people are left there with the knowledge, with very little knowledge transfer. And the new people come in and therefore you have all these different systems and all these different places of data without knowing why or how they're in place. So it's important to kind of under, understand the origins of that um, in order to move forward. So let's talk about setting up the data, right? Before I actually uncover this whole slide, I'm just gonna write on the slide real quick, but typically like there's a, a couple issues you see with data. Sometimes what happens is you have someone pull the, oops, let me see. You have someone pull in the data and then they put some kind of, they, they, they filter it somehow, oops. They, do, they put some kind of filter on it and then now, now the person has it and then they present it in, in terms of a document, right? Sometimes there's a request for where it's emailed where someone has to get two data sources, put it together, and then someone has to process it and then they email it to someone else. So there's like a touch point here and then some mixing of the data, which may or may not be true if you look at the reports in its raw form, um, which eventually leads to reporting. Um, so those are just a couple situations of where data can go wrong, but in an ideal workplace, you want the best way to, um, to have your data is you have all these data sources, whether it's Excel files, CSVs, whether it's um, databases that you have set up, whether it's cloud storage places that you have things set up, whether it's ERM systems like SAP or Oracle or wherever you have your data, to be able to come into one place and in a clean way and as granular as possible, and then be able to take that data, scrub it and clean it and to be able to put into clean databases. So that way you have one source of truth. Um, in a perfect world, uh, 
this is kind of what it should look like. This is by no this is by means an oversimplification of a data architecture. This is just definitely not the main way, but this is kind of in an ideal world. You have data in one place, it's cleansed and it's ready to be used by end users on the right end. Um, this is where a lot of times in this section right here in the middle with the scrubbing of the data is where tools like Tableau Prep and Alterx and all these other ETL tools come in to extract, transform, and load your data. Um, but it's really important to have good clean data because it's the most important thing. There's this quote that I want to bring up called good decisions you make on bad data are just bad decisions you don't know yet. So your, your people and the executives and leadership depend on your work and you need to make sure that your data is clean before you go in. It doesn't matter how pretty your Tableau workbooks or, or how, how amazing your dashboards are. If you're, it's based on bad data, the, the, people that are making decisions are gonna make decisions on that data. So you, it's it's crucial to have that data clean piece in and with, with no errors, no duplication, nothing that would taint your data. Otherwise it builds distrust within the organization. And that's where a lot of uh, data programs fail and fall apart. So it's always good within creating these data pipelines to have a single source of truth. I like to think of in an ideal world is that you wanna create an ecosystem that is end to almost end. Um, and what does that mean? Well. It's having data up to the point where people can pull from it from like a data mart and essentially leave it up to the person to bring it up, leave it up to the last mile up to the end users to decide how to analyze that data. Essentially, like if you're a Tableau user, having that data that's cleaned when you bring it in and already used by any person in the organization that needs to use that data and where you can pull other departments data and know that that's the same source of truth that they're using, whether it's in HR, finance, manufacturing, operations, wherever you're at, that it's all the same data sources that they're using and it's cleaned. Um, and, and the reason you want to make it end to almost end rather than end to end, when you create dashboards and, and BIs, uh, business intelligence that is fully answers the question without actually talking to the people. It's um, you're only solving one question at a time. But when you have a single source of truth that leads up to the almost end, it allows for the building of a data culture to build that data curiosity and to be able to take data that they have and work with it and experiment with it and come up with their own solutions from it instead of just having it go to a single a single person a single expert with that. Um, so these are some things in terms of building a data-driven culture. Like when you reinforce data-driven actions, um, you need to consistently reinforce those goals and purpose for the change. If you don't reinforce those purpose for change, then people won't really buy in because they won't understand why there's change in general. A lot, a lot of the times in organizations, I see people resistant to change. So you need to continually reinforce those goals and purposes for that. Um, leaders, like they promote data in di different ways, but it takes time and hard work for those leaders to adapt to and represent uh, a data different culture. So persistent use of like exploration of the data and broadening um, business insights and center your actions around data can be seen by, that can be seen by employers or promote even their curiosity in discovering more from the data. Um, leaders need to pr promote that and make sure that they support their staff in being able to do that. Um, the next one is like setting expectations. Um, for the data, like you want to provide people with support and the opportunity to receive insights and ideas from others as they begin to work with data. So again, this is kind of setting up the support system, whether that is having a like a dedicated person that's dedicated to a certain tools data tool that either trains, provides self-service uh, training, whether, and I'll get to these in other slides, but there's a, a bunch of different ways you can support your students, your um, employees with training. Um, uh, as we talked about end to almost end, you want to structure your data in a flexible way. And then finally, allowing end users to make data insights on their own. You want to encourage people to ask those questions, to explore, to solve those business problems and how that relates to daily tasks or goals. And um, when you're driving the culture, you have a chance to manage the change as well. So when you manage the change, you have to take into account like the change management aspect of that. That's, and this is more from a leadership standpoint, but um, for any change effort or work, there has to be accountability and follow through. You can't just drop an initiative and allow someone and on someone and can't tell them without telling them like how to do it or how they will be evaluated, measured, or checked. Um, establishing and community how the progress of the initiative will be monitored is like super important. So accountability and kind of setting those roles and up at the forefront, vitally important. Um, you have to have employee buy-in. You have to show them what's in it for them, what 
is the why behind that change and why it needs to be identified. Um, if you don't have the buy-in, then um, people won't use the tool. Simply that they won't use the dashboard you make. They they won't use the the things, and it'll just fall apart. You just bought a tool for nothing. And then finally, you need executive sponsorship. It's not just enough the buy, the employees buy-in, but you need to have the support um, of everyone on the ground. You need to know that the from the top down, why this initiative matters, and again, why it's important. Um, so here's some keys to quick success. E essentially, when you're starting up a program, you want to have at least three th people in place. You want to have your executive sponsor, your basically your person that has his foot in the strategy area um, from a high level, working with the tools expert, who's someone, for example, if you're an expert in Tableau, to be able to understand and bridge that gap between strategy and business, to be able to talk to the data specialist, which is the person that's most technical and understands the data close at hand. That's that person that knows that ERM system or that data source and what everything means. So that way the tools expert can translate that into business insights, which can you know, lead up to what the executive sponsor has on its plate. So these are kind of three items that need to be in place to, to have success in any business. If you skip one or the other, um, you'll have, if you forget, for example, if you skip the data specialist, you, you might make interpretations on the data that may not be true. It's always good to have a domain expert on it. If you don't have the executive sponsor, you're making guesses on what management and your leadership wants. So those are, those are two crucial um, key points that you need. So now moving into dashboard maturity, um, there's kind of three approaches when approaching dashboards. Sometimes, and I, I kind of seem like in these three, three standards, you have like your standard approach. It gets exciting ex, ex first, and, but it loses luster. And a lot of the reasons for this is because they're not taking the audience into consideration. You're just making metrics and things that may or may not be relevant or may be too general for someone to actually act on. Common responses, as you say, like, could you explain what I'm seeing here? What's the point of this visual? Um, when you start to kind of go up in level, you kind of have a mixed approach where now you start to create things that are helpful and more interesting to the forward thinking approach where now you, you make things where it's crucial to the job at hand. So when you make a dashboard where someone utilizes it every day and it replaces them, you know, reproducing an Excel sheet each day, that's when you start to get to that maturity stage of a dashboard where now people are adopting it more, more quickly. Here's some other items that I'm just going to quickly like shuffle over. Um, but essentially like on the standard BI side, you they have things that aren't tailored toward the audience, doesn't provide much feedback in the mixed approach. Um, you know, there's things that only present insights for the current moment or insights that are not presented in a uh, contextual way. Um, forward thinking is like things that you can instantly draw insights from um, and and it's organized in an intuitive way. So these are just some like quick things. I'm not gonna leave this and read them all to you, but these are some quick items. So now let's talk about, now let's get into the fun stuff. Now let's talk about like database, da dashboard architecture. So there's, I consider three levels when you're building out your dashboards. And this is not just like in an individual department, but if you're a person on a Tableau side and you're trying to build out da Tableau uh, pipelines and Tableau, um, kind of dashboards that are used for the whole enterprise as a whole. So when you first stop at the, start at the top level, you wanna move from most macro to micro. So essentially you wanna start off with enterprise type analytics from a top level. How is our company doing? What is sales? What is revenue? And then break that down into its subsections, right? So in terms of what are those big departments that are dependent on generating those areas of revenue and, and vice versa and having those little individual pieces. And then if you see in the orange, or the pink, or I'd say coral, if you would call that, um, kind of having individual and more granularity up to the individual level. So building it from a top level, this is typically what you'd want to see for in a most perfect case. Um, next is when you're trying to build it on the dashboard level, most companies, they read from left to right. So essentially you want to start from the left being the most macro to the right being more micro, but as you go down, you get more and more complex with it. Essentially, like if I have one metrics up top, these are going to be like maybe your cards where they have one item where you can just instantly see if you're doing good or bad. But then if I want to drill into it, as I go down further in the dashboards or in other dashboards, um, I can see that, hey, what are those drivers of those things that indicate on my KPIs? So these are going to be your main KPIs. The next level would be individual dashboards catered to your other, um, other areas that you're looking at. Um, and then finally, in terms of drilling down in the data, if you have a KPI, you want to be able to, when you're structuring your, your worksheets, 
not just structuring worksheets in, in every crisp cut way you can do it, but be able to answer those questions within this metrics. If I have a certain metrics on sales or a certain revenue metrics, like who are those key players? What happened? Like, what are those things that played into it? Like what, are, like what areas or um, product lines or what are those things that messed up? What happened? Like, was it, what happened in the manufacturing process? Was it vendor? Was it a lead time issue? Was it a shipping issue? What is that? When did it happen? Like at what point does it happen every seasonal at, is it a seasonal thing is it something that happens at the end of the month like what what's kind of and then where like is this happening at certain locations all the way to the point where you can actually if someone really wanted to they can dial into the actual data in the data table so when thinking about structuring your dashboards think about these questions um so here's some keys to like quick success when you're starting out you're building out dashboards start out small start out validating your data um concentrate on big pain points for people that are using the data and then run a pilot. So don't do this like one, one for every department, but try it in one small subsection where like using the dashboard would only impact people in a small section. And as that continues to draw success and interest, continually expand that out. Um, here's some best practices. I'll leave this up for a little bit. These are really good from my experience in working with Tableau and other programs. These are some things that I concocted together to that really works. So like starting with the audience needs and minds, always having those people that are actually using the dashboards have their input and continual input, even have working sessions where they work with the data with you and, and see what you're making. Um, simplify user navigation to help them know what to expect. Titles, 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 super important. People neglect the, the aspect of how titles can help people do it. We, we see, see our dashboards and we see our cards all day that we know the data, but if someone new looks at the data, they don't know that they're looking at. So the more comments and the more titles and subtitles you have in your data, the better, um, like descriptions rather. Um, again, top, top to top left to bottom, right, kind of organize that sheet in terms of priority Enlarge <clears throat> the size of the most important sheets in the dashboard and keep it less critical summary numbers, um, to give primary takeaway message, uh, name sheets, um, in order the questions being answered, that always helps in terms of when you expand out your dashboards, understanding and where to place it in the dashboard. Um, chart types matches the, the data story. A lot of people neglect the data story. And then um, try to limit four to six per dashboard. If you, there's always cases where you can put more or less, but that's kind of a good rule of thumb. Um, uh, the final couple of things I want to touch on on UX design. Um, there's a bunch of different laws. I'll kind of cover these briefly, like Hicks law. It's basically the time it takes for to make a decision increases as the number of and complexity of choices increase. So when you make dashboards that are simple and not complex, it makes people that are using the dashboards able to make the decisions quicker, faster, and more efficiently. Um, so keep simplicity in, in, in mind when you're making these. Um, Doherty's threshold, uh, one of the best things you can do and th th this is basically productivity soars when a computer and its users interact at a pace that ensures neither, basically it's just limiting wait time. So Dor Dorothy's threshold is basically, if you can make your dashboards and when they're published um, publicly, where they, it doesn't have to load when they change a filter or doesn't, where it's, it's very quick and fast moving, that'll increase the usability of your dashboards. Um, I, I've seen people make dashboards where it takes a minute or two to load any kind of filtering because it's filtering on millions of rows. If you can subset your data to what's relevant to the user, you can make your dashboards quicker. Therefore, it'll be used more. Um, Jacob's Law. Um, you, Jacob's Law is one of those things is when you're implementing new, new tools and people are used to a certain tool, Jacob's Law, people like to use things that are similar to what they've used before. So if you can make Tableau similar to things and the dashboard similar to things, that they're used to seeing, whether it's in color schemes, whether it's in you know functionality, whether they have filters before, if you can try to capture those in your new product, if you're trying to implement a dashboard, um, that'll be super useful in them implementing and using it. The aesthetics usability effect, it's basically saying that if something's aesthetically pleasing in design, it's more usable. So that's why Aesthetics is a usable, is an important piece of building a dashboard. It's not the number one piece, but it's one of the main pieces once you kind of get to the end where you find that the data is useful and you build something that's useful is making it aesthetically pleasing. On the last two, Fitz Law, um, it's basically one of those items where you're trying to like limit, limit the, I guess the, the complexity of your dashboard 
in terms of, so making buttons that are big enough for people to click, um, filters that are big enough for people to use and see, and creating kind of that aesthetic that makes it user for the easier to use. If it's hard to like click on a button and you can't see it, or if it's hidden, or if it doesn't look like a button, that's going to add complexity and, and not usability. And then finally, Miller's Law, um, it's, it's trying to, going back to that rule of four to six cards per dashboard is an average person can only keep seven plus or minus two items in their working memory. So people aren't keeping a lot of stuff in their memory. So the more complex, and if you have drill downs that go into other things that open up other worksheets, people are going to forget what they're looking at and, and it's going to scale the usability of it. Um, finally, there's gestalt principles, which I want to show. I made this uh, slide of drawing your audience's attention in terms of visuals. It, um, these principles allow you when you are making your dashboards, what to pull in to kind of highlight and draw your audience's attention to certain things. So if you have, for example, color to draw to a certain thing that you're trying to highlight in your data story or markings or maybe orientation, saturation, these are all little things that you can do to your visuals to be able to simplify them and to be able to draw the user's attention to be able to draw those insights even quicker, going back to the aesthetic usability effect. Um, so what can you do today? If, if you're an individual contributor, a lot of stuff I talked was high level, but if you're an individual contributor, these are things that I would do. I, like become data curious, be curious about the data you're working with, what how it interacts with other areas of the business and how it would ask those questions with your boss and in of the data of itself and with the business, become a kind of an owner and understand how you can make your areas better in terms of quality, cost savings, effectiveness, efficiency, all of that. Um, understand the KPIs, how they relate to the department organization as a whole. You can automate, I, I emphasize this much, if you can automate the cleaning and processing as much as possible in your area and upstream. So anytime you can take your data and automate that process when you don't have to extract it from Excel and you create you know, scripts that can just extract and do all the processing that processing that you need that you don't even have to do anything to your data. You just have to do it. Anytime you eliminate any kind of human touch on the process, you're going to make your life better and make the lives of the people that are using your data better. Um, experimenting with the data using other, like it's, I always like interacting other data sets. If I pull, what happens if I pull in finance data with HR data or with sales data with like operations data or employee kind of productivity data, like just creating experiments with your data, uh, collaborating with areas, and that goes to collaborating with other people of your business. If you can learn what other people's um, problems are, you can kind of build those interactives and that's interactivities with that and understanding um, what people will, is important to these different areas of business. And you can actually get a bigger picture of that. Um, pitching ideas, piloting new initiatives, um, documenting and commenting everything. Um, that's a big part of knowledge transfer and transferring um, and being able to train other people up as well. Uh, so when people do take over your work or if you need to pass things on, um, people will be able to pick up where you left off. And then continually learning. Like you're here at, you know, a Tableau user group to learn more and more. Um, I, I like YouTube personally uh, to learn a lot of these things, but yeah, become your local subject matter expert and you'll go really far. But that's all I have for you guys. Sorry if it was dry. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a wealth of information. Um, so from my experience, but I hope you enjoyed. Okay. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? I've got one last slide to share. Uh, that was great. That's that's this meeting. I want to talk about the next meeting and now uh, where we go from here. First of all, if if you're not using the most current version, the most current version was I think it dropped today. It was on uh, 2022.1.3 is the most current version of uh, desktop. Uh, try to stay current if you can. And I know some of you have IT departments that say, no, we're going to stay a year behind or a uh, virgin behind. This is the latest version. This is not a major, a major change. But they did clean up some things that needed to be changed. Uh, career opportunities. Tableau is always looking for people. So uh, if you're in, in a job search mode, uh, tableau.com about careers is a place to look. 
JLL is always looking for people. And I looked this, this morning out there, and they do have jobs here in the U.S. or on the uh, U.S. We heard one more. Who is it back there? Louisiana Pacific. Louisiana Pacific. Do you want to put? Uh, you want to put a uh, link in the chat so people know how to get to you and and what is the job itself? Uh, I'm not logged in, so I can't put a link in the chat. Um, okay. But it is a BI analyst role. Uh, primarily focused in Tableau with occasional RBI. Um, okay, that opportunity is here in Nashville. It is. So here if you're here in, in Nashville, Nashville and you're, okay, you're looking for an opportunity here in Nashville, go out to uh, the LP site, Louisiana Pacific site, and look under, is it under careers? It is. Look under careers, and there's an opportunity out here right here in Nashville. Probably could be a good uh, opportunity. I have one too. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm at Pearson. I'm with Solomon Consulting, and we have a BI uh, consultant role out there. Um, before Analytics takes all the BI people. Um, <laughs> no, actually, it's, actually, it's JLL is taking all the people. Yeah, yeah, so I was thinking with was you for, for yeah. people. So, um, so yeah. So um, hit me up on LinkedIn, and I can I can forward the link. Okay, is that your national? It's it's 100% remote, but we have a new Nashville office we just opened. Okay, um, in, within the last year. Fabulous! Thank you for sharing. Uh, just thank yeah. You. Thank you. Okay, just uh, yesterday uh, they announced that the ambassador nominations for this year are now open. So if you've been working with somebody or you know somebody who you think is deserving of being an ambassador, one of the Tableau ambassadors. Uh, now is the time that you would nominate them. There, uh, the nominations are open for uh, about three weeks. The link that you see on the screen, just go to tableau.com, and you'll see it on you'll see it on the forum. You'll see it just on the uh, community page about the overall program and about how you go about nominating people. There are several categories. Uh, there's a social ambassador, and Seku is a social uh, uh, a social ambassador. There's user groups, like this user group. If you have a user group leader like Eric or somebody or other user group leaders that you want to nominate as an ambassador, now is the time to do that. There's a forums ambassador. I happen to be a forums ambassador. Tableau public ambassador, a student ambassador. If you have a student who's proficient in Tableau and you'd like to recognize them, okay, you can nominate them. Uh, and I happen to mentor. Uh, each year I mentor. A student and they're thrilled to do it, and they are great kids. You know, it's a wonderful opportunity for them. It's something that not only goes on their resume, but they carry it with them and they have uh, responsibilities along the way. There are dev ambassadors for uh, people who are in development, and finally, new category CRM or analyst. And if you've been following that, CRM has changed name to analyst, and it goes back and forth for uh, people who are CRM. Uh, experience and experts in CRM. I'm type of people that you want to nominate as an ambassador there. Our next meeting is going to be the end of July, July 27th. It's going to be a virtual meeting. Okay, no pizza next time. Unless mm -hmm. you bring your own. It'll be at 3 30 in the afternoon. And we are always looking for people to get involved. And I'll probably, I should enjoy an adult beverage out there, I'll probably tap a few of you on the shoulder about getting involved on the leadership role and being part of the organization. So thank you very much for being with us tonight. Eric, do you have anything to say? Anything you want to cover off? Anybody else? Yes. yes. Uh, one other thing, um, this is Ed Pearson again. Um, I don't know how it works. You know, <laughs> 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 but, but anyway, we're starting a data engineering uh, meetup starting next month. Um, we're going to meet at NSS. So if you or you have engineers in your orgs that we want to be cross, you know, cross cloud, multi-cloud, yeah. um, cross technology. So um, you know, we'd love to have as many people as possible as we kind of adjust to getting back into like the real world. Yeah. NSS is next national school soft software. Yeah, software school. So okay. that's what we're gonna be. So okay, very good. Anybody else? Let's start. Thank you for being with us tonight. Yes, thanks for coming. Night out. Good night.